stupid. So this week, we're going to get loopy. We are talking about looping, loops. And what are loops? Well, they're our first foray into reusability. And as we go on, you will find that reusability is my favorite topic in programming. Um, and yes, that's what happens to you after you work a very long time in programming. You get things like favorite topics that are odd. So what is reusability? Um, what it's not is copying and pasting. What it is is reusing the same chunk of code again and again and again without having to write it again. Now, why is this important? Why is reusability important? There is it's kind of a saying that basically goes, if you catch it in requirements, when somebody's telling you what they need, it will, a bug will cost you a dollar to fix. If you catch it in design, it will cost you $10 to fix. If you catch it during development, it will cost you $100 to fix. And if you catch it when it's out in the field, it will cost you $1,000 to fix. So the more code you end up writing, the more likely it is that you're going to have lots of bugs or bugs. And the more, higher probability is that they're going to have to spend money to fix it. So if we can reduce the amount of code we write while getting the same amount of functionality, we've actually become more efficient, not just from a programming perspective, but from a monetary perspective. And that is important because somebody's paying me to write code. It's my job to write it well and as efficient as possible. So that's why reusability from a business standpoint when you're coding is important. But also, I don't like doing the same thing twice. If I can write one piece of code that's succinct and compact and does exactly what I want it to do and I can use that again and again and again, I've saved myself a lot of time and given myself the freedom to go and do something else that might be more interesting. So we have some new keywords this week. We have the keyword while. The keyword while tells Python that it is about to make a decision repeatedly. And we also have for, which ad, ad, tells Python, it's going to make a decision repeatedly. What's the difference? The difference is that the while loop needs an exit condition that's um, more, what do I want to say? The exit condition for the while loop is more, it, it, it's more obvious than the exit condition for the for loop. The for loop, you kind of write it exactly how it's going to be. I use for loops more than I use while loops in my daily in my in my daily work but that's also because I have a finite list of things even if I'm getting stuff from a database it's still a finite list and I know what I have how many things I have to evaluate while is the opposite while you don't have to know how many things you're going to evaluate before you get into the list you can just let that list keep going and then when you figure out that there's an exit condition you can get out of the loop in is checks if a value is present in a sequence or a list. Um, and it's used a lot with for loops. In fact, in was made for the for loop. Break, it stops the loop, stops the execution. It's just done. Continue halts the execution or stops the execution, but then goes back to the top of the loop to, to go through the loop again. So those are our new keywords. Some new concepts. There's a concept called iteration. And what that is, is it's a single trip through the local scope that is inside the loop. Remember last week we talked about global scopes and local scopes. And if statements have these local scopes. Well, looping is making a decision. So while it doesn't use the if keyword, it is still making a decision and still has has to have a local scope underneath it that it can execute. 
So an iteration is one pass through that local scope code. And the Sentinel value is just a special value that determines when to terminate the condition of a loop. And we're going to use Sentinel values with while loops. So let's talk about a while loop. And the first thing I want to say about while loops, and I'm going to say this until Module 7, is that you need to get comfortable with while loops because while you're going to use a while loop as your gameplay loop in your final project. So you have to you have to get used to this to using a while loop. Okay, so here I've got some code and I have a variable test. I know it's a variable, it's on the left hand side of a single equal sign. On the right hand side I've got the word go. And then test is uh, let's go back down to the while and then I'll explain more about test. Then I have the next line, I have the while keyword. The while keyword says, hey Python, I'm about to make a decision repeatedly. So that's what it's going to do. This is a question or another true-false question, just like we had last week when we talked true-false questions. This week we're talking true-false questions. But a lot, but, but, and some number of them and we don't necessarily know how many when we're programming. So the way I can read this line is test is not equal to Q, true or false. Now when I look at this line, test is equal to go and go is not equal to Q, which means it evaluates to true. Just like with branching last week when we had if statements, when the statement evaluates to true, it goes into the local scope. So, yeah, this is just saying what I did before. And you still have to have a conditional operator, all, all Boolean operators, just like you had to have with an if statement. Q is the sentinel value. Q is the value that when, when test evaluates, when test is set to Q, and you get to this line of code, the while loop will stop. It will just break out. It won't do it anymore. And then we have what's the local scope of the while loop, the code block inside the while loop. Those two lines of code basically say, basically tell us what we're doing. So it says print your input format test. So it tells you what you put in and then it's going to ask you to put in another value. And that's because you have to change the the variable that's tested against the sentinel value inside the loop. If you don't, you're just going to run forever and you'll get actually an it uh Zybooks, your labs if you do that it will tell you that it timed out because you it thought you had an infinite loop. So if you get that error in Zybooks, you need to go back and see whether or not the input for your while loop is being modified um, inside the while loop or if it's been modified outside because of like formatting or something. So I also talk about code blocks. So the line that begins with print and the line that begins with test underneath it are the code block that is inside the while loop or in the local scope of the while loop. So we have a few rules. Sentinel is a value which defines the exit condition for a while loop. So when the Sentinel value evaluates and the variable that you're testing against it evaluate to true, the loop stops. Um, a while loop will execute until the sentinel until the sentinel value is reached, and that could be never. Um, like all conditional statements, just like all of the branch all all of the if elif statements last week, you have to remember the colon at the end. If not. It'll drive you crazy. 
Okay, so we're just going to follow this test and see what happens. So test is set to go. And go is not Q. So it's going to go down. It's going to print your input format. And then I'm going to, Professor Lisa is going to sit there and she's going to at put hello. So hello is going to be brought up to the top of the while loop. I've just completed the first iteration. Test is now equal to hello. Hello is not equal to Q. So we're going to do it all again. So we go inside the while loop. We're going to print out our information. We're going to add, okay, put in a word or Q for quit. And as we know with an input statement, it'll just stop and wait. So I'm going to put in Q to quit. Test is now Q. The second iteration is complete. And since Q is equal to Q, so the statement evaluates default, Q not equal to Q is false. Then we're at the end of the loop and we just stop. We don't do anything else. A while loop flowchart. So I always like to use this to, to help people visualize what that loop is. So this is the exact same code we just looked at. I have a variable that I'm setting, a test that I'm setting to go. And I have an if statement. You'll notice I didn't use a while. I didn't use the keyword while because I don't. What I'm making is a decision. And the way I set the flow up is the loop. So, test is not equal to Q, that's a true statement, it outputs test, it inputs test, I go back up and ask that question again. And I keep doing that until test, somebody types in Q and you have test now equaling Q, which will force the condition to be false and it will end. So notice where the loop is. That is an iteration. Okay, so we're going to follow our test again, just real quick through the input, and see how our little queue went through the loop. Okay, counting with while. We do this because it's, a, it's something you can do. I almost never count with a while loop. In my real life, I use for loops. If I have to count it, it's going to be in a for loop. Um, as long as I know the ending, as long as I know how many or what at what point to end. So this is basically, I have a variable called counter. Counter, I know it's a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. The right-hand side is zero. So my counter is set equal to zero. So while counter is less than three, I'm going to do something. Um, in this case, I'm going to print counter is, and I'm just going to print that out, and then I'm going to increment counter. So I'm changing the value of counter inside the loop. I should have pushed the buttons. So counter is the test value. Three is the sentinel value here. And I'm going through the loop, and I started at zero. I incremented it to one. Now it's incremented to two. I'm incrementing it to 3. 3 is not less than 3, so I'm done. That's how you count with a while loop. And again, what's important is we are changing that test variable that we're checking against the sentinel value inside the loop, inside that code block. If we don't, well, let's go through and look at some code. And by the way, um, if anybody hasn't been in the class, if you have questions, put them in the chat. And at the end of this, we'll open up the mics and people can ask any questions they want and we can go over like labs or assignments or things like that. So, uh, which one is that? Okay. one is this
Okay, let's look at this one. This one is, or do I just have my example while here? While with Sentinel. Whoops. Okay, so here's my while with Sentinel. And it basically tells us what we need to do. So let's just, let's do this. While with Sentinel. Okay, I'm going to debug because we all know how much I like the debugger. And I'm starting here up at the top, and I am on line three, but it has not yet been executed. I'm going to step over line three, and when I go to my variables, you will see it change, and there will be the variable answer, and it is set equal to Y. Now, just like we did last week, if I am in the debugger running the program and I mouse over the relational operator, it will tell me the outcome of that line of code. So the outcome for this iteration through the loop is true, which means that when I step over the while loop, I go in to the local scope of the while loop. And it says input, what is the answer? I'm going to step over, it's going to wait because it's an input statement. I'm going to say the answer is 42. I'm going to print out the answer is. Now we can see here under our variables that the variable value for the answer. So the value for the variable answer has been changed to 42. Well, 42 is not equal to Q. Is that true or false? That's a true statement. So I'm going to step over that, and now I'm back inside the local scope because the, the statement evaluated to true in line 5. Input, what is the answer? I'm not going to make everybody wait. The answer is now Q. I'm going to step over, whoops, I thought I hit Q. Well, it doesn't matter because the empty space, just, a, just mm -hmm. an empty quotes, is not Q. And what's going to happen is it's going to not go into the local scope. It's going to go to the next line in the global scope. The next line in the global scope, when the, the statement on line 5 evaluates defaults, which is it about, it's about to do, by the way, I can still mouse over. Oh, it says true. No, that's not right. Okay, let's do this again. Oh, I know what was going on. It hadn't actually read in my answer. I hadn't stepped over properly. So don't let that confuse you. The It, it did take that cue. It just, uh, I I did not step over correctly with the input statement. So it's Q now, it's going to evaluate defaults, and now what I said was going to happen happens. We are going to then not execute line six and seven because we don't ever do the local scope of a loop if the statement of the loop evaluates defaults. And then we're done. There we are. So now let's look at the counting with a while loop. This is basically just what we saw before. And in this case, rather than, um, I don't do any inputs in this. It's just easier. Oh, and we don't need to. So I have n equal 10. I'll actually make it 3 so it doesn't take as long. I have counter equals zero. My <clears throat> while loop is counter le counter is less than or equal to capital the value in capital N, true or false. Capital N has the value three, and I just did it this way because I want to show you that you can evaluate two variables. So N is 
has a value of 3, counter has a value of 0, and I can use one on the left-hand side and one on the right-hand side. The sentinel, sorry, the yeah, the sentinel value is still 3, even though I'm using the variable that represents 3. So I'm going to print counter is, and then I'm going to say counter equal counter plus 1, as long as counter is less than or equal to 3. And at the end, I'm going to print all done with the loop. So let's walk through this real quick. Uh, wow, count. Okay. So we're going to debug this. Um, I just had my first break point on line six because you guys didn't need to see it um, assigning n and counter. So counter is zero, n is three, counter is less than or equal to n. That's a true statement. So it will now execute the code inside the local scope of that while loop. So it's going to hit line seven, and it's just going to print it out. And then it's going to increment the counter. So if it increments the counter, it is changing the value that's going to be evaluated against the sentinel. So counter becomes one, and n is still three. One is, in fact, less than or equal to three. So we're going to do it again. Now we're at two. We're going to do another iteration through the loop. We are now at three. Three is, in fact, less than or equal to three because of that equal sign. So we're going to step over. We come up to the top. We're at four. And we will not execute the code inside the local scope of the loop. And I'm going to say print all done. So I'm going to show you a logic error real quick. And I'm only ever going to do this debugging because I can break out of it. So what did I just do? Well, this was here. 8 was tabbed in once. But that meant it's inside the local scope of the while loop. But I am now moving it because I tabbed backwards, I am moving it into the global scope of the program, which means it will not be executed when I go inside the while loop. So let's debug this and see what that one change did. So I'm back to the while loop. Counter is 0. N is 3. We know we're going to go inside the loop. I'm going to step over. I'm going to print. And lo and behold, that counter does not get incremented because it's not inside the local scope of that while loop. And so I'm just going to keep going. This will run forever until you find a way to stop it because there's no exit condition. There's no way to get to the exit condition. The exit condition is only that, you know, counter has to be greater than 3. But we're never going to get to it because we're not incrementing counter. We're not changing the condition of the loop. We are simply printing zero out again and again and again. That's all we're going to do. Just those two lines. That's happening simply because I moved counter into the global scope. So you have to have something inside the loop that changes, that, that changes the outcome of that question. When I have something that, that changes the outcome of the question and I run it, I get 0, 1, 2, 3, and it ends just fine. If I don't, then I'm just going to print out 0 ad infinitum. So I just wanted you to see that. And it's something to be aware of because if you're in Zybooks Labs and your while loops look something like this with the counter, um, outside of the local scope of the while loop, you're going to get that infinite loop error that Zybooks will give you. Okay, for loops. I use for loops all the time. Mostly because the data that I work on is finite. 
it's from a database, it's from something else, maybe it's from a file, so I know where the ending will be. Okay, so four is my keyword. After four is a variable. Now, num is just a variable that is defined inside the for loop. It is not defined, unlike the while loop, where you had to define test outside of the while loop. Um, for you don't do that. For you define the variable just like this. It will simply create the variable for you. So it's the keyword for the name of a variable. Now that variable is a local scope variable. It's not available outside the local scope of this loop. Then I have the keyword in. In says, hey Python, expect a sequence. So for says expect that you're going to make this decision repeatedly. In says that there's some sequence, maybe the sequence of letters, maybe the sequence of numbers. In this case, we're using the range function, and we will talk more about the range function in a couple of slides. But um, basically, the range function just creates you a sequence of numbers. And you can do some other stuff with it, which is kind of neat, like you can do odds and evens, which is something you're going to have to do in a lab, and which we will look at in just a bit. Um, you can read this, basically says, as long as num is less than three, keep on going. So in one line we did in what had to be done in several lines in the while loop. So, and then I'm just going to print num is format num. This code block will only be executed if num is less than three. Now this is interesting because it's essentially what we did in that while loop. However, the while loop had one, two, three, four lines of code because you got it for a while loop. You got to define that test variable outside of the while loop before you, the while loop exists. Then you've got the statement. Then you've got two lines because you've got to increment as well. Whereas the for loop, we don't have to worry about that. The for loop does all of that for us, which is why for loops are infinitely easier, in my opinion, when you're dealing with data that has a, a finite end. So um, two lines of code as opposed to four lines of code, more efficient, easier. Now there are times when you absolutely have to have a while loop, like in your game, because the user is going to be inputting their move. And so you don't know how many moves they're going to input. You don't know if they're going to input seven. You don't know if they're going to input ten to get to the end of the game. So you have to have a while loop for the game. But for a lot of other things you will do, a for loop will hit the mark and make you write less code, and it will be much easier. Okay. We'll talk about range in a bit, but... The for loop defines that special variable, that test variable. That's all num is. I, it's just a variable. There's nothing special about it. Could have called it Fred. It simply contains the current value of where you are in the range. It's almost like a placeholder. Um, as with all conditional statements, the for loop has to end with a colon. Don't forget the colon. Okay, let's talk about range. On the previous slide, there was for num in range three. And then it outputs what the num is. In is the keyword has two purposes. Is It determines if a value is contained in a sequence. And then we often use it for this to iterate over that sequence. So that's what we're doing. Because you could use in in an if statement well, but here we're using it um, in a for loop. Now range is the second time we have encountered a function that allows for optional parameters. The first one was print. Remember you can do print and then at the end you can either just do print and then whatever you're going to print. Or you can do print and then after everything you're going to print you do a comma end equal quote, space, quote, for like a space, that is 
a um, print is a function that takes optional arguments. Range is a function that takes optional arguments, which means sometimes I can sometimes have things and sometimes not. I always have to have the stop. I have to say, where is this range going to stop? How big is this range? I can't create an infinite range. But I can also tell it where to start, and I can also tell it what the increment is. Start is just that. Where in the range do you want to start? Maybe I don't want to start with zero. Maybe I want to start with 12. Who knows? Range is simply a function. Python gives it to us for free, just like print and stir and int and a lot of those. Under the hood, it creates a sequence of numbers. Now, a sequence of numbers is kind of, uh, the way range works is kind of special. Start is inclusive. Stop is not. So, start is also zero. And if you don't put it, it defaults to zero. And increment defaults to one. But increment could be anything. If I want to go backwards in a loop, I could increment by minus one. If I wanted to do every other element in the loop, I could increment by two. So the increment can be changed to a lots of different things. And so you can make the loop behave differently by just changing those parameters. Okay, so we're going to now follow the nums for range. For this one, I'm just not needed. So I have for number in range three. Range is going to create a sequence of numbers, zero, one, and two, because three is the stop place and it is not inclusive. So it's always going to be, in this case, three minus one or whatever that um, stop value is, minus one. So num is zero. I'm going to print num is zero. I go up. I get the next uh, element out of the range, and that's one. So now it's going to print num is one. There's still more in that range. Two is the next value in the range. Num is two. And then there's no more values in the range, so I'm done. And it's that simple. I could have changed that range to 10, and it would have behaved the same. OK, so we're going to go look at the flow chart again, just because I want you to see that from a language agnostic perspective, from the perspective of a flow chart, or even pseudocode, that while and for look the same, they all have the same, it's just that same loop, just like we saw before. And that's all I really wanted to talk to you about for this flow chart, is that it's not much different than a while loop. A loop is a loop is a loop. It's how you determine how to end that loop. If I have user input, active user input, whether it be from a keyboard, a joystick, whatever, I'm going to want a while loop uh, that, that just lets that thing happen. If I have finite data, if I have retrieved a set of data from a database, or if I'm counting something, I want a for loop. Okay, a little bit more about range, because you're going to have to do this in a lab this week. So print every other number between 1 and 5 inclusive. So how do we do this? Well, I have the range function, and I have three parameters. I have start, I have stop, and I have increment. So if, I wanna, if I'm going to print every other number between 1 and 5, inclusive of 5, which means I, I want 5 to be as part of the range, well, I have to start my range with 1. I don't want it to start at 0. And it's always going to default to 0 unless I put that first parameter. So range starts at 1. 
it ends at 6 minus 1, so it's going to end at 5. And I want to increment by 2 because it's every other number. And what that gives me is a range with the values 1, 3, and 5. And so I will do for, I'm going to print num is. It's going to print num is 1. It's going to go back up to the top. It's going to grab the 3. It's going to print num is 3. It's going to go back up to the top, grab 5. Num is 5. Now, I think your lab may have you doing it backwards through the numbers and every other number. And in this, that case, you would start at the, at the bigger number. You would start at like a, uh, a 5, and then you would go to 0, and your increment would be minus 2. So just keep that in mind when you're doing the lab. And then we're done. Nested loops. Um, you can, just like with a branch, any branch, you can include a branch and a branch and a branch and a branch. You can have as many nested loops as you like. And this becomes important when you're doing matrices, rows and columns. If you've ever seen a spreadsheet, you've seen a matrix, you've seen something with rows and columns. And so the programmatic equivalent to that are nested loops. And we're going to do a lot more with nested loops when we get into lists and dictionaries, mostly lists, which won't be until Module 6, but it's good to start understanding it now. So this is just an example. Uh, it's Challenge 4.13, and it says, given the number of uh, rows and a number of columns write a nested loop to print a rectangle. So basically I want a rectangle of stars. This is a perfect uh, use for a for loop because I know how many rows I'm going to have and I know how many columns I'm going to have. So I can use a for loop and I can use the range because I'm going to have some number. Some user is going to input rows it's going to input columns, and then it's going to output a star followed by a space every time I get to the intersection of a row and a column. And when it's done with that row, it's going to start all over again and do the next row. So let's see how this works. So Professor Lee is going to say, I'm going to have two rows and two columns. So this, what's on the right side, is showing you what the outer counter is and the inner counter is. So you'll notice I have a for loop that says outer in range row. So that's my outer for loop. And then inside the local scope of the outer for loop is an inner for loop. That inner for loop deals with the columns. The outer for loop deals with the rows. So. Outer is 0, inner is 0. I'm going to print a star followed by a space. Then I'm going to go back up to the inner loop. I don't go back up to the outer one. I, do, I run through that inner loop until it's all done. And then I go back up and I start, I start brand new on the second row. So I'm still in the inner loop, haven't touched that outer loop. The inner loop is now going to be, the inner loop counter, called inner, is now going to be 1. I'm going to print my star again. Now I'm going to say, hey, I've got two columns. So inner, go up back to inner. Inner is 2. So 2 is no longer in range because it was 0 and 1 because remember, it will always increment 1, and it will start at 0. And the last number is not inclusive. So it's done its thing. It's done two stars. So what happens is I'm going to print, and I'm doing that for a new line. Now that print 
is actually in the same scope as the for loop. It is not in the, in the local scope of the inner for loop. It is in the local scope of the outer for loop. So it will print a new line. And I'm going to go back all the way up to the top of that outer loop. Now, what happens here is it's like the inner for loop never executed. It's starting from scratch. The only thing that the outer for loop knows now is that it is on, it's, it's starting again. And it's going to increment it was at zero. Now it's going to be at one. But the inner for loop is just going to start all over again. It's going to start at zero. It's brand new as far as um, Python is concerned. So I'm going to print a star, but it's now on the next line. And then I'm going to go up back to the inner loop because I haven't made it to the outer loop yet. I'm going to print another star. I go back up to the inner loop. I am now at two on the inner loop. That can't be because I can only have two. So it's zero and one. So I'm going to now print a new line. I'm going to go back up to the outer loop. The outer loop now evaluates to two, and I'm done. So I also want to show you this. It's 4.1.3. Yes. Can you search in a range? No. A range gives you, um, the range creates a sequence. That's what it does. And, and so you can look at it as almost a list. That in keyword is telling you, well, I'm sorry. Do you mean something like if? Because I was trying to, if I remember correctly, I was trying to, uh, one of the labs on uh, the previous week, I try to have it search within a range, like if it was within 1 to 31, if if search in range, if it's in within this range, and execute the loop. Uh, and I think what I think what you basically said is that range you can't you can't search in a range though, right? You can't just you, if it has. That. Let's just try that. I haven't ever I haven't ever done it. So my knee-jerk reaction is, well, I don't think I can. That doesn't mean we can't. So let's just say if for in range uh, 7, is that what you mean? Yeah, that's what I tried to do. Something so like let's that. see what happened. You can search in a range. It works. Wow. Huh. But the answer is yes. That's interesting. I it must is. have not. I must have not done that. I uh, must have not had the correct format when I was trying to do it on one of my code for one of the labs. I was trying to have it. I was trying to have it search in the range, and it just apparently it just wasn't kicking it correctly. But that's that's neat. Yeah, it is. <laughs> thanks, for the, thanks for asking the question. Yeah. Okay. So to answer your questions, Joshua, how long will that go for? Only two rows. Yes, Joshua. 4.13, is that it? Well, that's not good. Uh, nested four. Here we go. Yes, what we did will only go for two rows. And we'll look at it here in just a moment. Um, oh, and this will, but that will print numbers. That's okay. And let me look at the other one. Sorry. What does it mean by exactly search in a range? So what we were just doing was testing a theory. Um, what we were doing or was it while with Sentinel? No, that's not where it was. Which one was it? Was it range? Nope. No. Uh, it was... Let's go and look. Is this one? Nope. 
Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, you're fine. Not to be sorry about. All questions are good questions. Next out of bounds. Well, we'll just type it in something else. And while count. It's if you check your run down here at the bottom. It's oh, good. okay. While count. Thank you very much. Not a problem. Did I get rid of it though? I did not. So, Joshua, what he asked, what what Anthony asked was, can you search in a range? So the range is whatever the sequence is that's created by by that function call. So the range that's created by that function call would be, um, it would be this. Let me just type that out. I think it'll be easier. So it would be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's what range would create right there. So the question was, instead of just using range in a for loop to increment our for loop, could we actually use it to, you know, see if some number was within this range? So that's what the question was. And so that's, that's what he meant by search in a range. Does the number four exist in the sequence that will be created by that function? And the answer is yes. Cool. Yeah, I I apparently just wasn't formatting it correctly, and I I was curious about it because I started experimenting with it, and I was trying to sit there and do it in the lab, and it just I just didn't apparently have it set up correctly. Was it the um Was it the lab with the seasons? Ah, I think that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to use range to uh, set up for the seasons, and it didn't hit correctly. You can use in, um, definitely, like with all the months and stuff. I don't know why it wouldn't have hit correctly, but anyway, I didn't look at your codes, so it's okay. not in my class. So sorry, Anthony. So we're just going to comment this out so that I don't forget. And what were we looking at? We were looking at nested for loops. Nested for loops. So here is what we were talking about. Now this is a little different because I'm going to say outer, or we're going to multiply outer and inner. So we're going to get a value just kind of to show you. Or actually, the better thing to do would be to do this. Um, Format, inner and outer. That would be better. So now we can actually see what's happening. So I'm going to input a number, I'm going to input another number, and then we're going to build a matrix. But the, the matrix for this is going to be comprised of this outer counter and this inner counter. So we can actually see what's happening. So let us go to nested four. Uh, nested four. Walk through this a bit. So I'm just going to debug because we know I like the debugger. So I'm going to put in. I'm going to put in three, and I'm going to put in four. Hold on. Okay, so now I'm in the outer loop, so let's go and look at variables. Now what we won't see here is we won't see a variable in variables. Sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. We will see a variable in variables for the outer and the inner. So I've just defined outer, which is zero, and inner is going to be zero. So if I look at the console, what I should be printing out is zero, zero, and I am. Now I go back up to the top of the inner loop because inner is still zero. I'm going to increment inner once. So inner is one, outer is still zero, and inner is 
still less than four. Yeah, four. So I'm going to say zero one, and it's going to say sorry, zero zero. I'm sorry. I'm going to stop this. I'm making this confusing. It should have been outer for the row and inner for the um because we want to do row wise so it would be outer which is the row and inner which is the column so let's do this again uh step over console three and step over four so as we can see with the console what's going to happen is it's going to be zero 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 one because remember we're all we're not changing the row we're changing the column so it's going to be zero two zero 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 one zero two zero three and I've done just did the fourth one because I started at zero and then I'm going to print a new line and now I'm back up at the outer loop the outer loop is going to increment the outer variable to one. The inner is starting from scratch. It, it's like it never was run before. So I'm going to say inner. I'm now on row one, back to column zero, then column one, column two, and column three. So inner is now three which is fine, but when I increment it, when I go over this line, it's going to say, sorry, that's for, and I'm going to go back up to the outer loop. So at the outer loop, it's like the inner loop was never run. Again, counter is, the outer counter is now two. I'm going to go back and run through this with the inner. And then I go back up to the top about to change that value to three which means that I'm no longer in the range and I'm done so that is how that works so when you're dealing I think there's one where you're dealing with having to build that matrix in one of the labs um, that's what you do okay you always have to remember once you make it back up to the top of the loop the outer loop it's like the inner loop was never run it starts from scratch Okay, uh, break and continue. Sometimes you just want to stop. That's what break does. Um, break basically says exit the loop. Just stop. And we can do this if we put in conditionals, we put in if statements inside of a loop, which you will have for your game. Um, I can just, it doesn't have to get, it doesn't, test does never, test doesn't have to be done, doesn't have to be the word done for this to finish. It can simply be 42, and if 42 is in the test, then it's going to print right answer and it's going to break, and break is just literally going to stop everything. And um, in a loop, and it will break out of the loop that it's in. So if I was in that um, nested loop, it would break out of, and the, and the break was in the inner loop, it would break out of the inner loop, but not the outer loop. So this is, test is just a space, test, so test isn't done. I'm going to enter 42. It's going to say um, if time is in test, so is the is the word time in test? Well, no, because I put it in 42, so that's false. Then I'm going to say if 42 in test, then the, that is correct. So that's true. I'm going to print right answer, and I'm going to break, and I'm done. I go back out to the done. And it, it doesn't matter what it else is in that particular loop. And it can go through this again and again and again. I could have, you know, put in Q and it would have just run through this and it would have said try again or done to stop and then it would have continued to go. So when you're 
thinking about your game, you want to think about the scenario for breaking. All of the games, part of the requirements for the game is that you allow the player to exit with the word exit, the word quit, the, the, the letter Q. It should be part of your instructions. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that if you're giving them a, a way to stop the game, that once that condition for the stop evaluates to true, that you break. So that's how you're going to implement that ability to break out of your game. Continue. Continue is a little different. Continue basically says stop what you're doing but go back to the top of the loop. So it doesn't completely break out of the loop. It just says, okay, I don't want to, in this case, print the, the word and. I want to get rid of it. So I have a string. I'm going to split my string into um, a list, and that list is going to be one and two and three. But I don't want the word and, so I'm going to get rid of that by using a for loop. That for loop, and, and now, by the way, this is another way to use in. You'll see I have four item in my list. I didn't use range there. I just used my list. My list is already a sequence because it's a list. So I can simply evaluate whatever variable is in, whatever value is in item and say, is it, does it actually exist in this list? So item is one. If item equal is, is equivalent to the word and continue, it's not. So I'm going to print item with a comma. I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. I'm going to look at the next item, which is and. There we go. It is and. I don't want to print and, so I'm going to go back up to the top of the list. I now have the number two. I'm going to print two. I've got and again. Still don't want and. So I'm going to continue. I have three. I'm going to print three, and I'm going to be done. So that's the difference between break and continue, and I know I'm holding you guys over. So we'll go over the pseudocode, and then you can still ask questions in the end if you have any. So uh, this is the first week we're really dealing with pseudocode. I do also have the flow charts in or partial flow charts in for this week, but next week there won't be any uh, flow charts. It will just be pseudocodes. So lab 4.4 is we're given a line of text as input. We're going to output the number of characters excluding spaces, periods, or commas. So a string is a sequence. So it has a finite end. So we can look for something in that finite list or sequence. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, it's going to we're going to input a, the first character, and then we're going to set a counter. But we want to set that counter in the global scope, so it's got to be set before you define the for loop, so that we can use it after the for loop exits. So it has to be in the global scope. So I'm going to say for each character in user text, whatever the user text was, I'm going to um, check if the character is not a space, is not a period, or is not a comma. If it's none of those, then I'm going to increment that counter that I defined outside the for loop. I'm just going to let it do its thing, and then when I'm done, I'm going to print out the character count. So this is basically how to use a for loop within. Okay? And this is just the uh, flowchart for it. 
Okay, 4.15. Here is what we're doing here is we are creating a password. So we're given a password. So we're given a word. And we're going to create a password given that word. And we're going to do it by modifying some of the things in the password string and then adding it. So what do we have to do? Well, what we have to do, and by the way, I just used while here because I wanted to show an example of the, um, the pseudocode with a while. But you could have, is, this could has this could, as easily have been a for loop. So if it's an I, I'm going to change it to an exclamation point. If it's an A, I'm going to change it to the at. If it's a lowercase m, I'm going to change it to an upper, uppercase m. If it's a uppercase b, I'm going to change it to a zero. If it's a lowercase o, I'm going to change it to a dot. So what do I have to do? Well, I have to go through every character in the word. And I have to create a new string in the process because remember, um, you can't you you can't create you can't modify a string in place. Strings are immutable. So I'm going to go through each character in the word, and I'm just going to check it based on my if statements. If any of these things is true in the if or the else if statements, then I'm just going to set password equal to password plus and then whatever the new character is. Otherwise, so if it gets all the way to the else, I'm just going to say whatever the word at care count, wherever I am. And then I'm going to increment the care count, and I'm going to start again. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go through each of those and I'm going to basically at the end when I'm out of the loop I'm going to say password equals password plus Q star S and I'm going to print out my password. So this is a single loop not a double loop but we do have lots of if conditions in it. And I'm sorry that flowchart is just crazy. Here. It's much better if you don't look at it in animation because I think my animation was just off. Okay, so here, um, here is our, uh, and you sh this should be a for loop. Here is our multidimensional loop. We're going to create a matrix. We're going to create, we have a height and uh, a character and a height. And we're going to um, output the character, whatever character it is, for so many rows and so many columns. So if counter is less than height, and then if counter, if inner counter is less than or equal to counter. So what we're doing here is, I, this is the triangle one. We're only, we're building a triangle here. So you have to, as the rows, as you as you go up in rows, or sorry, as you increase in rows, you're going to increase in the width of the output, which is going to make a triangle. So this is a little different, and what's different than the one we saw is that the one we saw had both had a a row count and a column count. This doesn't. This has a height count. So what you're doing is you're starting at one and you're going to print out one character. And then with the second row, you're going to print out two. With the third row, you're going to print out three. Fourth row, you're going to print out four and, and so forth until you get to the height. So this is the logic to do that. And remember, when you do the output, you have to make sure you output a space on the inner loop, you have to make sure you output a space um, and not a new line after the character. And yeah, that's this is the triangle program. And then finally, we have what is this one? Oh, this is just where you're replacing words and creating what they call a Mad Lib, which is just 
you're replacing words in a, a sentence. And Zybooks has the exact sentence. So you're going to have words, and you're going to have tokens, and you're going to input it and then split it. And then basically you're going to say, um, for token is zero is not equal to quit, output eating tokens of I, tokens, so tokens of one, tokens of zero, a day keeps the doctor away. And then you're going to have somebody input a word and input a token. And this is the time where you have to use a while loop because the evaluation of the while condition depends on the, it depends on user input. So there is no finite end. Because there's no finite end, you need to use a while loop. So does anybody have any questions? Oh, by the way, I like the discussion, Anthony, about uh, searching with range. Thank you for bringing that up. Oh, yeah, not a problem. I just, I apparently didn't have it set up correctly to actually execute the condition. And I had to end up actually scrapping that. That was what was really bad, is I actually had that set up to where it would, if, um, where it would go if uh, season is in this part of the range, um, print this, but it just wasn't executing correctly. I couldn't get it to work. It's okay. unfortunate. <laughs> um, if, does anybody have any other questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, everybody, have a great weekend. This should be up hopefully tomorrow. And um, if you're in my class, as always, feel free to reach out to me. I will do my best to get back to you in a timely manner and help you with any of your coding questions. Good night, everybody.